Good afternoon and good morning to those on the West Coast. Thank you for joining our Reimagine Talent webinar, your EVP, the reason, the power, and the how-to brought to you today by People Science. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. And if you aren't familiar with us yet, People Science provides talent acquisition advisory services, recruitment process outsourcing, we like to call it partnering ourselves, recruitment placement services, and our new proprietary software, HireGate, which is an HR technology that augments the applicant tracking system to provide recruitment data and AI-driven insights. You can visit us at people-science.com to learn more or reach out to us if you have a recruiting opportunity or challenge you'd like to discuss. So my name is Jessica Oberto. I am the Director of Process and Implementation at People Science, and I'll be your moderator for the next hour. You'll find that these webinars are more conversational between our panelists and guests. So if at any point during today's discussion, if you'd like to join in, pose a comment, make a question, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen to do that, and we'll make sure we do our best to get back to you. And now I'd like to introduce our panel of experts. As always, our webinar presenter is Christine Nicholas. Christine's a visionary in the talent acquisition industry and a widely respected thought leader on all aspects of recruiting. She is the founder and CEO of People Science and Hiregate. After leaving a corporate leadership position within the staffing industry, Christine founded People Science to help companies solve their toughest recruiting challenges and really transform how they acquire talent they need today and in the future. For nearly two decades, she led the development of cutting edge information systems, processes, and methodologies of people science. She also developed the recruiting continuum methodology, which is the cornerstone of people science's success. You can learn more about the recruiting continuum on the people science website. And on to our special guest this month, Deb Kroger. Deb leads talent related strategies for a fast growth biotech company. Her 35 plus years of experience span diverse industries, including retail, hospitality, higher ed, and financial services. And with those last 17 years, she's led recruiting and talent management strategies in domestic and global biotech and pharma companies. Her perspective reflects a business mindset with a marketing and sales orientation to attract, develop, and retain talent to achieve an organization's goals and objectives, combined with a dedication to helping individuals identify and fulfill their purpose, motivation, and potential. Welcome, Deb. We're so happy to have you here with us today. Thanks, Jessica. And thanks, Christine, for the invitation. Absolutely. The crowd goes crazy. <laughs> so those were our introductions. And with that, Christine, I will hand it over to you to get started. Great. And while Jess is pulling up the slides, that, are, that we'll just take a quick look at where we are as far as the labor force in the U.S. is concerned. I just want to say thank you, Deb, for coming. You're in for a treat, gang. So... We're still arguing, Jess and I, or Deb and I are still arguing about where we met. I say we met in Atlanta. What are you, are you still, did you say Chicago? Like a, a long time ago. And we fast, we were stranded there, right? We couldn't get yeah. out we to the same conference. We actually wound up meeting in the airport. We couldn't get out. So we wound up spending like 24 hours. Of course, we had hotel rooms, but we, we found out we had a lot in common, right? So, and that was like five jobs ago, I guess, for you, but. Deb has just been instrumental for me as far as understanding the kind of value that can come from somebody who's got this headset, deep set understanding of marketing and sales with this uh, vast understanding of talent acquisition and HR. She's recently um, attained her master's, right, Deb? Yeah, MBA. Yeah. Yep. So Deb, Deb is brilliant. I mean, she's got the intellect. I am not me bragging about anybody. But she really has the intellect that goes along with the, I'm going to say scrappy. She's able to get in there, make the change, make it right, and get it going. So as um, as we move into the conversation today, listen to how she built the EVP uh, mm -hmm. for a few different companies and, and ask her questions because you don't get this opportunity that often. She's a busy lady. So happy to have you, Deb. Okay. Thank you, Christine. You're welcome. So... Unemployment rates, if we're looking, of course, we have to look April to April. So I think it's going to be very interesting coming up on next month to say, you know, of course, this is reflective of March. So what really did happen in the month of April going into, you know, into May and what's going on? You can see that we really haven't gone above 3.9 in the last year. This, I think, is going to be a big telltale. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to have a big effect. 
even if we see that go up to four, I think you're going to see the Fed start to look at things a little bit differently. Now, that said, I think we should show employment out and we see, we need to run our economy differently without that equation in there until we get our arms around all this. That's my point of view. That's kind of where we're going. So not a lot of change, but really important to see what happens next month. Okay. As far as, and we're going to look at two more stats. First, we're going to look at the employment added and lost. And I had some questions um, from our last, actually from a TikTok that I did and and so, from some social media about what's the difference between the JOLTS report and the jobs added. So in the month of April, we added 175,000 new jobs, meaning people working. Another 175,000 people started working in April, unique people to the workforce are re-entering the workforce. If you look back to June of last year, it was 105. Mm -hmm. If you look back to April, it was pretty close, 217. Look at what happened in January. Look at what happened in March. And Jess and I were just talking for our next webinar for next month in June. We're going to show you looking at a couple of years, right? Because these spikes are kind of indicative of what happens with employment. What's going to be really interesting? Again, I think there's, you know, every time these stats come out now, we're all kind of on our edge of seats saying what's really transpiring. Um, I think we're going to see a status quo. I don't think we're going to see a big jump from April. That would surprise me. Um, I don't know if you have a sentiment about that, Deb, if you think you're going to see, we're going to see a big increase. I think it's going to kind of hold steady from what we saw in April. Any thoughts there, Jess? I would Deb? agree for May and June. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with that. Great. So the Jolts report. So the JOLTS report talks about jobs at it, measuring job boards, looking at companies' websites. This is how the federal government comes up with these numbers. We can see up, down, up, down, headed towards a downturn. I don't think we're going to see a big change here. I, you know, I don't think we're going to see a giant spike. I think in the fourth quarter, we might see it come back up again. But one thing holds true when we look at all three of these indicators. Employment is somewhat of an anomaly from where it has been for the last 40 years in our uh, in shaping our economy. <laughs> And that it is held steadfast at a good clip. We have a lot of people working. We have a lot of people um, transforming their own positions. And of course, our whole world of work is in, in flux. So let's move along to our next topic. Sorry, Jess, I keep expecting another slide, right? Okay. Diversity and inclusion, which I'm now saying, right? So we've been talking about some of the frustration that we've had looking at the end of 2023 and going into 24, because effectively we've seen a 13% decrease. That's the most recent number I've seen, and that's only as of February, in people within the diversity space within an organization. So in 2021, going into 22, 23, to, to the half year mark in 23, we saw a lot more hiring going on in the diversity space, not to be confused with diversity hires, but people actually running diversity in organizations. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is the business has kind of said, mm, that's not necessarily working for us. So the trend now is to outsource that or bring consultants in. We're seeing a big trend away from the term, even DEI, rebranding even the entire department. So to give you an idea, in the past two weeks, I've heard from three different organizations the same thing without prompting. We're doing all inclusive hiring. Inclusive is key to our hiring. We're working towards a totally inclusive organization. And some of the names, some of the branding depth from a marketing perspective is kind of crazy. We hire all, I mean, things that you would not expect to see coming from diversity. So I'm happy to see this because I think up until this month, I've been feeling a little frustrated that did we, you know, do we pause in our evolution here to becoming a more equally balanced workforce. I don't think that's the case now. I do, and dollars are still being spent, probably less dollars still than what we've seen before, but at least the attention is still there. Um, especially, of course, as always with companies that have goals that are set because they are government contractors or have to meet compliance issues. So not necessarily shrinking, even though those positions within themselves might be shrinking. Next month, we're also going to take a look at supplier diversity within the organization. So that's something to keep in mind. We always talk about the world of work, of course, but diversity, suppliership to the HR segments, I think is, is really important. Okay, moving on to return to work. I mean, does this saga ever end? Um, 
so much drama. It, there's a lot of drama in the space going back and forth. But I think that we're starting to see it morph, right? I still don't think most organizations, particularly C-suite, understand what this is going to look like. I don't think any of us do yet. Uh, and I think AI has got a big influence on that, right? So if we're changing the way we work, and now we're changing where and how we work, we still haven't formulated a lot of that. Uh, so I think still moving pieces, but here's um, some very interesting stats that we were looking at. I've got to tell you, the number that I've heard on this is 42%. But when we think of uh, younger workers coming into the workforce, 43%, and this came from Forbes, by the way, the number I usually hear is 42%, but I've seen it, another number last night came up in my feed that said 22%, but 43% of people say they've married someone they met at work. So if we're not going to work, does that mean we're not going to get married anymore? I, you, who knows? Um, but I think when we say, you know, the challenge is coming, let me work the way I want to work, but I want to be around people, so keep me social. And that's really from a corporate perspective. What I'm hearing is how do we figure that out? How do we keep it social so that people feel like they're around their peers and they're learning? But how do we also give all this autonomy to work wherever you want to work? How do you actually organize that? That's a struggle. And if anybody in the audience or anybody that we know of has more information, we'd love to hear from you about that. Uh, we have a lot of different stories, but I haven't found anybody who said, hey, this is the solution that we found and we're sticking to it and we're happy with it. So with like, and I'm sure you're out there. So let us know. So in other words, you're two times more likely to marry a coworker than someone that you meet on a dating app. What happened? You know, what happened to oh, just you you meet somebody anywhere and marry them, right? Now it's like dating that. So, but two times more likely to meet somebody at work. All right. And this I thought was really interesting. And the reason that I'm bringing this up is 62% of the population is reporting relationship issues to HR. So here's some of the stats on that. People that said they cheated on a current partner with a colleague from work, 40%. Wow. And they say 37% say that they've heard of it happening, but 40% say they themselves have done it. 40%. Wait, so you're getting married, then you're cheating. I'm not sure. Uh, married someone who they met at work, 43, and 46 have heard of it. Changed jobs to start a romantic relationship with a current colleague. This blew me away. I mean, I never even thought about that statistic, but it's 47% of the people mm -hmm. who said they changed jobs to start a romantic relationship with a current colleague. Mm. So Deb, I'm in love with you and you move. And then yeah. I'm moving because you're moving. Like, oh, I, I thought, well, I interpreted that as maybe as a colleague, people develop romantic feelings for one and for one another. And then because of company policy, somebody made a change so that they could have the romantic relationship and not violate company policy. That's how I interpreted that. Supervisor Maybe a combination of both. You, yeah. you, Jessica? What? Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Maybe you're managing someone that you're interested in yeah. a relationship with and you take the risk and decide to move yeah. yourself or ask for a transfer. Um, and I think I misread it because I'm with you guys. Like we all know people that said I can't work here because I'm having yeah. a relationship yeah. with my boss. But the way it's written could change jobs to start a romantic relationship with a oh, okay. colleague. That's what kind of threw me. Officially start. Officially start. Right. So which is it, you 47%? If you're in there, let us know. We want to know. Inquiring minds need to know. Created a breakup plan for a relationship with a colleague, 29% and 34% said they've heard of it. What's that mean, create a, a breakup plan? Created a breakup plan for a relationship with a colleague. So if this doesn't work out, who's leaving? Oh, okay. to work out how we continue this relationship. Huh. You can just watch The Office, the 4,000 reruns, because they do it there all the time. If you need True. Help. That is, that's a good example. Satire. <laughs> but, you, you know, as, as much as we, we kid about this, okay, that's an important factor when you look at who you, who you have in your organization and why people come and why they go. So how does all of this affect the balance of the employee-employer work um, work relationship. Mm. I pulled some information. The Gardner's Work Trends for 2024 report is out. Um, the statement that I think really rings the most interesting to me at this part at this point is employee conflict um, resolution is the next must-have skill for managers. Mm. 
57% of managers say they're fully responsible. That scares the heck out of me. For resolving direct report conflicts. And in Gartner's opinion, and I think rightly so, this is the year. The next six months are intense with elections, Mm -hmm. geopolitical crises, labor strikes, climate change, the pushback on DEI efforts. It's just a ripe environment for conflict. And I think 57% of managers saying, I'm responsible to solve this is great. Hey, we're in with two feet, but we better skill these managers, right? I mean, you might think you're getting conflict resolution because you can break up a fight, but that might you know, be creating more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And really examining how these things happen ahead of time. The four key trends coming from the Gartner report are new manager necessities, which would lead to what we just said, right? Understanding that new managers understand the new world of work because there's so much confusion in there, but really that's where it resides, right? That's where change is pivotal. I'd almost say manager in the center, employee here, C-suite here. This is where it's happening. This is where HR's work needs to be. Crumbling career assumptions, both from people exiting the workforce, getting close to or deciding to stay in, but changing where they're going. Younger younger workers or people young to the workforce into the work environment saying, "How am I going to have a career if I want to work from home? And how does all of this work? That ladder doesn't exist anymore." And then, of course, AI reshaping work. But I thought, and a good segue into our big topic today, the number one item that they sh- they um, cited was the shifting employee value proposition, shifting EVP, because all these things we talked about. So with that. Enlighten us, Deb. Tell us about the work that you've done in the EVP arena. Yeah, so thanks again for the invitation. And, uh, you know, I invite questions and our dialogue around this. I think I've had the blessings and benefit of working with different size organizations, both domestic and global, and working on EVP work. And I think it, it might it might be well for all of us to at least align on a definition. And Jessica, if maybe we could just come up with the jet, the definition slide. I didn't I didn't bring a lot of slides with me, but I thought to support the conversation today. And and I'll precede this by saying everything that Christine outlined today um should be taken into consideration as you um develop your employer value proposition. Like low unemployment rates, you know, that's going to that should really be an informative factor for you to say we really need to pay attention to defining who we are and what differentiates us as an employer from our competition. Um, The the D&I conversation, um, I I think a lot of times we get caught up in semantics and the political and or legal atmosphere. At the end of the day, you know, people that care about D&I are going to look at the actions and the environment of your organization and make a determination about whether you actually practice it or not, regardless of whether you have a head of DE&I or you don't have one or it gets integrated. It's really where the rubber meets the road. And, you know, I was smiling as I was listening to your conversation about that topic because our organization is, is, you know, facing those same questions too, as a lot of the big organizations are. Um, And then the other thing around the EVP and, You know, how do you create that balance and provide the social atmosphere, uh, maintain the productivity, and at the same time, uh, create an environment that I wrote down a couple of things as you were talking again, you know, mental health and technology and AI and all those things coming together. Uh, You know, I have my own perspective on, you know, working in global environments, you work virtually for for a long time with colleagues across the world. Um, And yet there's other companies that have gone through the COVID transition and are finding it difficult to even answer the question, what do we need to do differently? Christine, to your last point about helping managers, you know, uh, create and work and lead in this new world of work. And I think it's incumbent on HR to help identify those tools and resources. It's not always about what, it's more about what can we do to help our managers lead differently and what are the implications of leading in a hybrid or a virtual world. 
So, so coming full circle back to all of these factors, as well as others influence the employer value proposition, it really is what, what is the promise that your employees, that you're giving to your employees, as well as prospective employees, what, what they can expect to experience as a result of joining your organization or company in exchange for the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they bring. And not only that, but it, it needs to align with your organization's mission, goals, and objectives, and it needs to truly be differentiated from your competition. And the components of that are a combination of your compensation and your benefits, you know, the career development, the training, the learning, the work-life balance, you know, the company culture. And, you know, I define company culture as those behaviors and values that come alive day in and day out in our respective organizations. Um, along with really understanding um, and having that alignment with the company's purpose and, and mission. So I don't know if I'll pause there and see if anybody has any question or comment um, and chat or anything relative to defining the employer value prop proposition. And then I can talk a little bit about how we've gone about doing that in different companies. I might be jumping the gun, but, you know, it always is a little, and Jess could probably answer this too, but I get confused between what is what is an organization's culture as compared to the EVP because they're so similar, right? I mean, I think of it like if this organization was a person, what are the characteristics of the person? And then how is that a value? Am I in the right train of thought or do you think it's more around? Yeah, I, I think an EVP is, is bigger than a culture. I think the culture to me is... Um, it is the behaviors and the values that get lived day in and day out. And um, from an HR perspective, I think it's the systems, the programs, the processes, the how do we reward, reward and recognize those behaviors and values that we say we have as an organization? And then what do we hold people accountable for or what do we let people get away with? Um, and I think people may be smiling or acknowledging thoughtfully about this because you, you, your culture is what gets rewarded and recognized, what gets ignored, what you as an organization is allowed to happen and what you hold your employees accountable to. Um, and that goes up and down the entire organization where I think our EVP, um, in my mind, it's broader than that. It is you know, your compensation, your benefits, how, what do you offer in terms of career development or career opportunities, how decisions get made in organizations um, around the work-life balance, whether you do offer hybrid or whether you require people to come in to the organ organization X number of days per week. Um, and then- so I can love your culture, but your EVP, let's say you're fully in in-house may not match my design. So EVP is more like those tactical components. I I think your company culture is a is one component of your EVP. And if your company culture is not aligned, it, it is not reflective of what you say your EVP is, um it it's then then you you will you'll know it um and i i think you hear that and, and a part of maybe if we go to the next slide so how do you how do you go about defining your evp well the first step is you have to do research and you have to aggregate data and the research that um you need to collect it can be primary and secondary research that encompasses understanding what your what your current employee population says about your current organization about why they join the organization why they stay what would make them leave what outside of the organization people that are considering the organization what or partners if you if you've got recruiting agencies what are the recruiting agencies hearing from people candidates that are considering your your organization as a potential employer. People that have left, what are they saying about the organization? And 
I also want to make sure that I'm clear at the outset to say this is not what your executives think. And I think that's one uh, caveat I would say at the outset where a lot of people say um, they pay attention to what one segment of the employee population says about what we think our EVP is, and they fail to validate that with a broader organization. And I've been a part of organizations where we've developed a global EVP, and that process that I'm outlining here took over a year to do, because in addition to uh, defining um, a, a, a an, an EVP that everyone can align to, you have to take into account country and cultural differences. Um, and we had multiple focus groups went out. And again, I'll, I'll walk through these segments here, but it, it involves partnering with communications and partnering with marketing. And your EVP, your employer value proposition, is a, is a subset and needs to be strategically aligned with your company value proposition. So when you talk about your mission and your goals and your, your company uh, value proposition, your employer value proposition is a subset and should be aligned with that. So, so the research that we did, um, again, encompassed, excuse me, use of employee surveys, um, organizing that information in terms of the different components of the EVP. And I really like Universum's uh, definition. They, they, they segment it into um, four different areas. Um, and then identifying the feedback that you get from the surveys and the focus groups into positive uh, comments, negative comments, and then neutral comments. And then really aggregating that data that falls into different buckets, and then taking that information and going back out to your employees and validating what you heard from them, and then presenting to them, developing the EVP directions, taking all that di aggregated data and creating what I'll call um, messaging, key messages that then get translated to what what can be referred to as EVP directions. And I don't want to get too caught up in the semantics here because if you're working with an external consultant or if you're doing this in-house, um, it's really about developing what that EVP story is and then making sure that whatever that story is that you're creating that was built out as a result of the research that you conducted and aggregating the data can be supported by what I refer to as proof points. Proof points are specific examples of, you know, this is what we heard. This is what we went out and, and validated. And then now we want to have very specific proof points that further validate what it is that we heard and we validated with our employee population. And quite frankly, the communications around this, whatever you're hearing from your frontline employees needs to be socialized and supported and validated throughout the entire organization. This is across functions too. Cross functionally could be multiple countries. Um, I'm anticipating that maybe some people might be thinking, well, could there be sub uh, cultures? To your point, Christine, like you hear a lot about organizations that have subcultures across different functions, and I think that that does get factored into an EVP. Can can people expect to experience a, a common culture depending on how large the organization is, or how small the organization is, or geographically um, where where they exist? Well, on our on our advisory side, and Jess leads that team. I don't, I don't want to speak for you, Jess, but an observation I think that we continuously made. First off, when you go in, everybody thinks they know, I'll oh, pick me, and they tell you what the EVP is. But when you're actually in the organization, and many times when we're doing advisory, we're actually running the recruiting, right? Or we're a big part of what's happening in the recruiting. So we're interfacing with the hiring managers, and we're talking to everybody from purchasing to HR all the way up the ladder. Um, we're uh, decoding it, right? It's kind of like, let me tell you who I am. Team, right? Well, you're getting a different story from me than from spending a day with me and finding out who I am. Because who really knows exactly who, right? 
I mean, that'd be great if we could all just describe that. But I think that's where we see the changes. And back to a point that you originally made, I have on more times than I can count on two hands, sat with someone in the C-suite who said, this is the kind of organization we are. And then they push that messaging. And although that's where they want to be, they are not there in all spaces. So when we talk about how does that information disseminate into your leadership from a C-suite perspective, then down the line to those managers, then into the individual departments, and then into the individual jobs, right? Because there's different values that are important at different levels. So understanding that this is my goal, but this is here where we are at this space and time, because when I see it backfire, it's when the proclamation yeah. comes out and then you go into recruiting and the whole time your internal team saying that, well, that's not who we are. So yeah. then they interview and like, that's not really who we are. So you, you don't get the highest. Or you have a handful of managers that says, yeah, that's who we are. And they bring them in and everybody leaves. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the point that you raised about authenticity Mm-hmm. Um, and truthfulness. And sometimes what you find out, you, you know, you, you you need to be courageous to have the conversations that if there is a, um, if there is a lack of, uh, of consistency across the organization, that needs to be addressed. Because to your point, if you communicate an EVP that is not authentic and not true, it doesn't take long for individuals to find. And then what happens? So what's the cost of not having an authentic EVP? You're not going to attract the right people. Um, you're you're, you're going to have higher turnover. Um, people aren't going to be as productive as they could be because what you said you were going to offer them in terms of the experience that you set the expectation for them to have is not what they experience when they join the organization. And that's a travesty. It's so many, so many levels from an individual perspective to a team perspective to um, all the way up the entire organization. Um, and it's tough too because it is perception. Yeah, but you know what? What I found really interesting, Christina, and the, I was I was going back. I told you in preparation for today. I went back and looked at the work that we did, and I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, this is taking so damn long. Like it took over a year and we, we invested a lot of money into uh, develop the the EVP, but I was amazed. And I literally across, I don't know, 13 key countries. I was amazed the key messages that were consistent, regardless of the cultures. And I'm talking China, Japan, um, Middle Eastern countries, the U. I mean, Europe, and and the consistency. When you see it, it's magical, like across the entire globe. And then you establish, um, when you define your global EVP, you establish guardrails that take into account cultural differences. And what I learned for those that that work in global organizations and can appreciate the cultural nuances about how um literal you, you need to you need to be very careful in global organizations about colloquialisms and meanings that if you use certain terminology in one country what it translates to in different countries and then that requires you to do further analysis about what's the common theme here where you're not um where you're able to identify the common EVP and then again add the the cultural nuances that need to be highlighted um, relative to local um, cu- customs or local cultural values. Um, and I, I hope that that is clear because it's it's recognizing that there can be a common EVP across regardless of culture. And then additive to that is taking into account cultural nuances and differences. Let me pause there. Does that make sense? I I think there's so many wins in determining it, but I really like the the guardrail on it because now you have a guardrail that you can follow. And I think when we, our HR um, followers here and so many of the people that we talk to in HR, 
I think the frustrations that we hear is that inability to get that cohesiveness together um, because things are in such a state of change. There's a lot of opinion around it. So having a guardrail that everybody, and that's so interesting that you're able to find that commonality. You know, I would wait even in the U.S. when we look at, you know, states versus states, look at what we're looking at now, right? We have like half the country in one direction, half half the states in one direction, half the states over our own internal things. So I think that would be a great exercise to get a diverse group of individuals and define the U.S. EVP. (laughs) You you can do that. Go ahead. (laughs) Uh, you, so, you do it and we'll have you on the show. <laughs> I'm I'm really busy. Oh, that's great. So I the testing, uh, just to, to transition to the next slide, after the testing of the EVP directions, what, what we did, you know, in, in the global organization that I worked in is, you know, we created an EVP story um, with visuals, tested them with those, um, those key focus groups globally again, um, and then... We, we created a, a message house. We had, a, you know, a single statement that was, that defined what our EVP was, that embodied our mission and our vision. And then we had, uh, I think, four or five pillars that defined what, it, what we were promising as a result of joining that organization with key messages and proof points that supported those key messages. Um, and and those were when I talk about the guardrails. Well, we had a message house that communicated the EVP with the visuals. The guardrails were really around what messages could you dial up versus dialing down as a result of the cultural differences. Um, someone it might be even within the function along too. Along this line, it, someone's asking. But also, to hear an actual example, not just the process of what to consider. Any examples that you can share without giving anything proprietary away? They're asking for um, some of the actual challenges or maybe some of the actual, this is this was one message that was clear. Yeah, I, th- I think, you know, around what our mission and our vision was, is that it was around, we really, uh, it was the, the one of the core competencies of our organization that we were most proud of was that innovative. And I know that there might be some other pharmaceutical or bio, bio tech, biotechnology companies on, but around pioneering and, and what, what everyone was really, really proud of in the organization was, and it was common, no matter what country, what function you worked in, the fact that we were pioneers in the space that we were in, that was something that was really core to who we are, who we were as a man. And that might be common to you, regardless of what, whether you're, uh, because I think in pharmaceutical and biotech companies, oh. I think pioneering and discovery um, is, is a core competency and, and, and being patient centric. However, I will add that in order for an EVP to really be uh, an EVP, it also has to, in encompass unique aspects of what differentiates you from your competition. And when I talked about the research earlier, what we did, we actually went to our competitors' websites and also heard from people that worked at those organizations. And again, you're you're getting feedback from individuals that have worked there as well as how they're representing their respective organizations on their website to see and, and if you do this, you will see the differences between you and your competitors, what's common and what's different. Um, and again, as an EVP, you want to end up identifying those aspects of your organization that are going to be unique um, relative to your uh, your competition. I'm trying to think of some other, one, one of the things that was really unique was their, uh, our culture, there was a familial sense of uh, working in our organization that people felt were was palpable in terms of how they work together day in and day out. And they acknowledge that as being very unique um, in contrast to some of the other organizations that they worked for in the past. And this transcended across um, organizations as well. Um, that That was a real differentiator for us. 
Um, and I can I can give you I can give you from our perspective, um, anonymous question person at, at People Science. It's a mission of People Science to elevate talent acquisition. So in the interview process, we look for and we try to promote in all of our advertising. If you want to make a difference, if you want to change, we don't want you right. to just come here and fill jobs. We want you to work on it and in it because that's what we do. So the people that come in are like, look, I'm a high volume processing person or whatever the case is or high ticket. I'm in and I'm out. Well, that's somebody we might consider as a consultant, but not somebody that we want to bring in internally because every single position, you know, on the RPO side, we're managing thousands of jobs, thousands of jobs. So still being able to work on it and in it is is a very, we have found is a very unique trait, but it's a key element in our interview process. It's part of our EVP. If you want to do that kind of work, you want to come here. If you don't want to do that kind of work, you don't want to be here because we're going to kind of, we would, we would probably, we would, you know, kind of say, why are you doing this? So I think it's a matter of, you know, really understanding what those things are. I also think in larger organizations, it's harder to do that, right? Um, an example, another example I saw was, you know, a C-suite that was making a proclamation that they were now a tech company because they created some softwares that supported the work that they were doing. They were not, in fact, a tech company. They had a lot of money. And they listened to branding people that told them, you know, you're a tech company now. Well, to become a tech company, you have to actually be a tech company and work in that space and learn it. And they had budget and they had some key people to do it. They wanted us to bring a lot of people from the Valley over to the East Coast, to New York. Um, and, and uh, you know, I was really concerned about this. And just as we thought, the turnover was really high. So understanding we're on our way. So changing their EVP to be a part of the change and looking for people that were able to come into a legacy organization. By the way, this is a common theme that we hear. When we say legacy, we mean good to great companies. I call them good to great. They've been around a really long, like Microsoft is now good to great, right? They weren't even a good to great when good to great came out. But organizations that have been around for a long time that are like everybody else in a flux of change, now adopting AI, and then saying we're on our way is very different from saying this is who we are now, right? And, and so you look for the people that will help you get there on, on the way, not the people who are already there who become immensely bored or feel so they've been deceived. I hope Jess, anything you can add to that? Do we get a good answer for this person then? Definitely. I know one of the consulting projects I worked on a few years ago, we had partnered with a smaller utility company in South Jersey. And they had, you know, rapidly been growing. They originally started as a, a small hometown utility company. You know, your cousins worked there, your aunt worked there. Most of their hires were from referrals. They were on the cusp, though, of knowing that in order to continue to grow and expand their outreach, they really needed to broaden the types of technologies they were using within the company, their processes, their methodologies. So they were very focused on you know, expanding their hiring pool just outside of this small community. So talking about pulling in graduates from Drexel, from Philadelphia, um, you know, moving people down from New York City to work in this smaller New Jersey town. So we went in, helped them do work with their EVP. And we were also managing their recruiting, which included in turn hiring as well. So working with some college students. And Deb, just as you said, we had done the focus groups with, you know, the lifers that had been at the company for 30 years. And then the, the newer employees that were there. And then talking to the people that were in their mid career range within the company. So it was, you know, it was a challenge though as well, because you're having these focus group meetings. You brought them all together for conversations to discuss the results. And you you had the lifers there that were a bit resistant to the change. It just wasn't what they were comfortable with. It wasn't what they had known. So being able to have those open conversations and also have the understanding, like you said, that there's not going to be one EVP for the whole organization or a group of people, or maybe even within a department. When I think about the EVP, I think of it as the employee saying, what's in it for me? What's motivating me to come to work for this company? So being able to, to have those conversations, which I wouldn't say they were uncomfortable, but they were opposing viewpoints at times, but then being able to go back and take all those thoughts and discussions into consideration and come up with a, a thoughtful 
employee candidate marketing plan that was focused on diversity and inclusion and still honoring those lifers that had been at the company was a bit of a challenge. But by carefully dissecting all the pieces, thinking about the impacts on hiring, and then delivering that through the the recruiter messaging to the interview messaging. And then when you have the hiring managers meeting with the candidates through training and onboarding, they were able to eventually smooth things out and realize that the EVP didn't have to have just one focus on one group of candidates. We could still look at that history they had in the community and give that its, its value as well. Yeah, Christine and Jessica, just to build on both of your comments and to um, give in thought as I'm listening about another example, one, one of the characteristics that we define that was important for people when we were attracting individuals, how do you describe your, your work culture in terms of, is it a scrappy environment where you don't have formal processes, tools, and systems in place and the type of people, if you're in, if your organization is in build mode versus a mature organization where those processes, tools, and systems are already in place, that's going to attract and be a different EVP message for a, a certain individual. Somebody that likes to build, that doesn't have to have that um, structure or um, build out already is going to be more attracted to an organization that has those things in place versus you don't want to attract somebody that may be used to that and then not make them aware of the culture that you have. It is scrappy. You're building, you're, you're starting out. And, and I'm sure people that are in biotech can appreciate that. I mean, I work in one that we, in the past two and a half years, we've grown from 200 to 450 employees. That is a very different environment than, than an organization that's got 10, 20, 30,000 employees that have been around for a long period of time and have formal processes and systems. Some people want, want to get that experience and then leave that to apply it to a biotech. Other folks like that biotech and, and want to build that and then move it. it. It really depends on where people are at relative to their own careers. And, and I think, Jessica, I think you hit the nail on the head. The EVP it, is defined for an organization, but at the end of the day, it's about aligning and defining your EVP in terms of what's what's in it for me, what's attractive to the target talent audience that you're trying to attract. And as you just suggested, what you market to different, and here's where the marketing and the sales come in. So you have to know who you are relative to your competition, whether it's an organization or a function. You, you've got to be able to package that. And then you've got to be able to segment your target talent audiences. And what do I mean by that? Well, there's many different ways you can segment your candidates. It can be based on function. It can be based on, you know, tenure, how long they've been working. It can be as simple as, am I targeting an active candidate or a passive candidate? Uh, you know, am I, am I targeting candidates that I know or that I don't know? And then how you go about marketing your EVP and how you go about sourcing candidates is going to be different based on how you segment that target talent. There's, there's that perception again, right? So the perception of somebody in purchasing is going to be different than the perception of somebody in sales yet how do you so you have to translate the evp to your audience right and exactly. i think the way that we do that at people science is by looking at the job families so that's some of the work that we do here but going back to one of the points that you said and i will i'll give another example of a large company that well a company that grew like incredibly so maybe maybe went from a thousand employees to nine thousand employees in less than three years, and then kept going. Now is like to got up to about two hundred thousand employees in like a ten year span, which is a good clip, right? So you see a lot of this in the valley, and if you don't see the growth that way, you see the growth in revenue. So in the early stages of a startup, it really is to quote Facebook: um, "Run fast and break things," right? But then when you get to know an or as an organization, it it's really key for HR to understand when that no longer serves you, right? So to be scrappy as a startup is one thing. When you get to a certain size, scrappy doesn't work anymore. And I think with one of the organizations that we partner with, we were able to come back because they said, everybody wants to work here. And we're like, yeah, we want this account. Everybody doesn't want to work here. 
And guess what? They didn't. They didn't. And, you know, we track those tiny data. As you're recruiting, we track the decline reasons. So within a very short period of time, we were able to, like, in the first three weeks, come back and say, damn, this is why, this is how many people don't want to work here. And this is why. They just didn't want to be part of that kind of culture. They wanted a different kind of culture. So we were able to change the messaging to target those kind of individuals and stay that course. And by doing that, you save a lot of money, a lot of time, and you just get better hires. So I think that's another good example. Well, I think that goes to that last point that you have to be doing this on an ongoing basis and reevaluating your EVP over time. And I, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to kind of, uh, you know, summarize what an EVP is, but then kind of go backwards to say, how do you validate your EVP and communicate it across different, um, across, yeah, how do you do that, uh, across different avenues? So, you know, identify, you know, the features of your EVP as we've defined it at the outset that are important to your talent audiences and then distinguish you and your organization apart from your competition, number one. And you have to understand what motivates your different talent segments. And then it's got to be strategically aligned with your corporate mission and your goals so that you can attract and retain current and future employees and continue to monitor it. And then that's going to help increase your recruitment effectiveness through hiring alignment. Um, and, and again, in terms of how do you go about um, communicating that, if you think you know what your EVP is, then I would invite anyone on the call to, to go back and assess how do you communicate that EVP in your different communication channels with your employees and in your internal, internal whether it's written or on your, on your intranet, your prospective employees on your websites and all materials that you present, you know, digital channels, whether it's, you know, in-house, even across your talent management processes. So if you're identifying your EVP, that goes back to one of the earlier points I made. If you identify what is different about working, what is the promise that you're making to your employees and your prospective employees, are your HR talent management processes supporting, rewarding, recognizing, reinforcing, and holding accountable to delivering on that EVP? Your, your career website, something as simple as your career website go out on Glassdoor or well uh, other different social media cha channels are what you think your EVP is, whether it's your executives or throughout the organization, being validated by any other social media messaging that's out there. I mean, our, and here's the other thing. Partner with, I, I did not do this enough due diligence. Make sure you're partnering with your, your corporate communications and or your marketing team. I heavily, heavily, heavily partnered with corporate communications throughout the entire journey, no matter what company it was at. Well, and Jess will tell you, if we don't have a clear line of sight to marketing and, and their overall brand, we won't we won't help them with their EVP because they're interchangeable. And I, I will tell you, if you're if you're trying to build your ROI on why this is important, go to your social media outlets, look at what the candidates are saying, look at what your employees are saying on Glassdoor, on Indeed, on Reddit, anywhere that you can find it. Really do some work there because the that is the most influential way. And Brit, well, actually the number one most influ influential way is when someone in the C-suite with an incredible amount of power and budget, you know, budget ability to control interview someone who says, this is not what I thought it was going to be. Right. I've seen that happen. It's not often, but when it does, it kind of gets, you know, the powers to be to say, we have to work on this. But yeah, Christine, think, that's actually a really good point. You know, a good way to validate your EVP too is, you know, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about metrics and then common mistakes to close out, but, you know, having 90 day follow-up interviews with new hires, to find out, you know, if what was represented to you during the, you know, the courting process and the hiring, is that what you're experiencing? You know, and that goes back to my earlier comment about what attracted you to this organization, you know, what, what, what keeps you here and what would make you leave? You know, those are three really good questions to ask your employees to find out about what, what your EVP is. Um, but some, some common metrics 
for the EVP, and we've talked about some of them today, is employee surveys. Um, and, and don't do surveys if you're not going to do anything with the data. I'm sure many people on this call have heard that before, but I, I can't emphasize enough. And and some some companies like to do them manually, but if if you're doing them so frequently, but then you're not going back to the employees to tell them what you did based on the feedback that you heard from the surveys, you're better off doing them less frequently and then injecting what you've done to address whatever um, issues, uh, opportunities were identified along the way. So employee surveys, the attrition rates. Um, I'm proud to say, you know, uh, the organization I work for, we've got single digit turnover and we've had that since I've joined. I, I mean, that's incredible in, in our industry. Employee referral rates. I mean, why do people uh, refer, you know, your own employees and, and percentages there? And then your quality of your hires and the alignment. Um, on the, there's, on the there's the there's that word alignment because I think what we see happen is in the interview process, the hiring managers at a certain point go into desperation mode, and then they negate the EVP and everything. Okay. I because today I need this person today. I feel it, mm. I feel the pressure. And all of a sudden the guy who was a four became a nine. Mm. Like so I think from HR's perspective, right? That and and even HR business partners coming in at that point and saying, wait a minute, we don't want to do this again in a month. Yeah. There, you know, I know it's tough right now, but the so having them not, I mean, I think that's been a part of the challenge too, right? Just having them not say, yeah, but I'm going to hire my brother-in-law anyway. Right? I shouldn't say that, but you know, or mm. my brother, sister's uncle anyway, because I know them. So it's not just a matter. I just want to get in that before we wind up closing. It's not just a matter of making sure it's in place and everybody buys in in the beginning. But when the rubber meets the road and you need to make a hire, holding your feet to the ground and saying, remember, it costs us $6,000 every time we turn an employee. You're going to be back at this for four months afterwards, you know, and being our own guidepost. Go ahead, Deb. Yeah, no, we're, we're fine. Um, and I'll just inject this. You know, I know um, there's some folks out there that want specific examples. I, I'm happy to connect with people on LinkedIn and I'll offer that up um, if, if there's additional conversation that anyone wants to have. And then I'm happy to, to provide more specific examples. Um, but common mistakes uh, of uh, EVP development that I think I've covered some, if not all of them, is one, not having one. <laughs> <laughs> because of whether you realize it or not, you have one. Uh, the big question is, do you want to own the narrative around it? Because if you don't own it, other people are owning it. You all have one today. Um, not differentiating enough from your competition. Um, and you may think that there is a lot of overlap. And I think that was one of the learnings I had, was that, you know, especially in this industry and in pharmaceutical budget. Everybody talks about being patient centric. Everybody talks about being innovative. That's not what it, your EVP is. Uh, your, your EVP is not just that. Your EVP is that in addition to, but what is it that differentiates you from your competitors that you're trying to recruit away from or recruiting in competition for? And another big mistake is making a top-down EVP. We talked about that. If it's just the executives that are creating the narrative, then and it's not shared um, and cascaded throughout the organization, that's that's a common mistake. Or being too general. I think I've talked enough about that. And then not doing the market research to inform your recruitment marketing strategy um, to understand what's important. And don't, you know, make sure that you avoid the one size fits all because what's attractive to a salesperson is not necessarily what's attractive to your IT person, what's attractive to your R&D professional, just to use my industry as an example. You know, early career uh, early career and career paths, you know, someone that's just starting in their career, they they may have some real energy and the what's in it for me, Jessica, that you highlighted around what is the career path that I can look forward to um, versus someone that is, you know, further along or mature and late stage careers, they might be interested in what the retirement packages are or what, what kind, and that's okay. As long as you're getting, again, that's it's the exchange. What are you offering as that EVP in exchange for the knowledge, skills, and abilities that that person is going to bring to the organization? And then finally, I know I highlighted this is not factoring in local and role-based differences. Definitely. Did we answer Marvin Smith's question, Jess? 
Um, his question was, how does the EVP differ from the talent brand? So I, th I think we spoke about that some a little bit, but really, you know, like a, Deb had mentioned, the EVP is very broad. So it includes the talent brand, which is going to have the marketing of the EVP and that piece for the candidates. But aside from just it being the talent brand, the EVP is the, the holistic view of the company. Why would I want to work here? What's in it for me? Deb, does that sound right? Yeah, I, I think when, when I heard the question, the first thing I thought of is the EVP is what it is mm -hmm. and the talent branding is the you're communicating what it is. Right. Um, so you're branding your organization to be what your EVP actually is. That's how I differentiate it. Great. Awesome. I know we're out of time. We're up to the hour. Uh, attendees, thank you as always for attending. I know our audience keeps growing. It's got some cool things coming up in store for the audience too, especially our, our followers who keep coming back month after month. That audience is about three times the size as it was before. We're happy to hear that. Thank All you again for the invitation, too. Christine. Great. Oh, Deb, thanks. I hope you'll come back again. I know this is an important topic. If you all would like to hear more about this, message us and let us know, and we'll schedule Deb back to talk more about EVP. We'll all talk about EVP even further. Um, or if you have any topic you'd like to discuss, get it out to us. Our next uh, uh, reimagining will be with Danielle Diliberto. Uh, do you know Danielle, Deborah? I don't. Yeah, you're going to love her. She's great. That's um, to at the end of June. Announcements will go out. Um, for that soon. Until then, let us know if we can answer any more questions. Again, always appreciate your questions and comments. Deb, thanks for being here. My Just pleasure. It's a great anchor. Everybody, have a great rest of our have show. Have a great week, week, everyone. All right. Bye now. Bye.